It is good to be together today. Um, so you can hear me now very well. Um, we're going to invite those who are chatting in the back to make their way into worship. And, um, and I want to invite those of you who are worshiping online to take a moment and fill out the jot form. You'll find a link to it in the YouTube comments. Um, if you're worshiping in the sanctuary, you'll find your connection card in the pew in front of you. Take a moment and fill that out. Let us know that you're here. You'll find a, a place that you can share your prayer concerns. We invite you to do that so we can be in prayer together in the coming week. If you're worshiping with us for the first time, we, today is World Communion Sunday, and we celebrate communion every day. And so if you're worshiping online, make sure you have elements that you um, are ready when, we, when it comes time for us to share in a holy meal together. If you're worshiping in the sanctuary, you'll find communion in front of you um, in the, the pew. And when it's time, you can just take that, open the bread, um, and we'll share that together, and then you can open the juice as we share in a holy meal. And now I invite you to take a deep breath and center your heart as we prepare for worship. What a beautiful day it is that we have been given. So let us worship together through our call to worship. Your words will be on the screen, and I invite you to stand as you're able. Around the world... People gather to break bread and pour wine. We gather with them in heart and mind. Around the world, broken body is made whole. As part of that body, we join in its unity. Around the world, the banquet of God is prepared for the table. We who share in the banquet come eagerly to be fed. Let us worship together. Let us share in God's bounty. be seated. Christian minister and teacher Oswald Chambers has said, our Lord's conception of discipleship is not that we work for God, but that God works through us. God cares deeply for all, for it was God who created all in beautiful diversity. Jesus' priority in ministry, as he claimed it in Luke's gospel, was for God's holy work of justice to be done through him. As followers of Christ, that is our call as well, to work for justice and, and freedom for the oppressed, to bring about wholeness in a fragmented world. 
One of the important ways that God's work of justice is done through us is in our efforts to be an anti-racist, pro-reconciling church. It is one of the four priorities of our denomination, the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. And so our call is to, to work together to dismantle racist structures that are barriers to equity and dignity for all people. This week, we will be receiving our special reconciliation offering. It is an over and above offering that uh, we give once a year. And half of your offering to this uh, reconciliation ministry goes to our denominational efforts to uh, do justice in the world. And then the other half stays right here in Alabama and Northwest Florida, our region, to support the reconciliation work that our regional anti-racism team is doing. Your generous support for this special reconciliation offering helps provide education and justice resources that enable us to more fully become the church we say we are. You can contribute to this special offering by um, writing a check and uh, putting reconciliation on the memo line, and then you can drop that in the offering box along with your regular offering this morning, or you can give online at our church website and uh, go to the giving page and then select reconciliation offering in the drop down menu and that will um, secure your gift online. As we put our faith into action through our giving, let us give praise to God. <laughs> this world, your healing, your saving work, brings justice for all of your people. As we give to enact your justice in our world, we do so knowing that your hand is at work through our actions. May our giving today bring your good news to life in the world for the sake of Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated, and it is time for me to invite our children to come down in front of the communion table for a special time of worship together with Robin. Hi, friends. How are you? Excellent. Good morning. How are you, Jace? Are you good? Excellent. Hi, girls. Okay. So today, I brought one of my favorite books. It's on my Kindle. Um, the title is All Are Welcome, and it's written by Alexandra Penfold and illustrated by Suzanne Kaufman. It's a book about school, but when I read it, it reminded me of church. So... The pictures are going to be on the screen, so you might want to get where you can see the screen because the pictures there are bigger. But here's the thing. I want you to listen very carefully. And when you hear a part that reminds you of church, I want you to raise your hand. Okay? All right. Are we ready? Okay. Pencils sharpened in their case. Bells are ringing, let's make haste, school's beginning, dreams to chase. All are welcome here. No matter how you start your day, or what you wear when you play, or if you come from far away, all are welcome here. In our classroom, safe and sound, fears are lost and hope is found. Raise your hand, we'll go around. All are welcome here. Gather now, let's all take part. We'll play music and we'll make art. We'll share stories from the heart. 
all are welcome here. Time for lunch. What a spread. A dozen different kinds of bread. Pass it around till everyone's fed. All are welcome here. Open doors. Rush outside. We will sing. We will slide. We'll have fun. Side by side. All are welcome here. We are part of a community. Our strength is in our diversity. A shelter from adversity. All are welcome here. All are welcome here. So much to learn, so much to do. And when the busy day is through, can't wait to come back and start anew. All are welcome here. Head for home to get some rest and greet tomorrow ready and fresh. Our time together is the best. All are welcome here. You have a place here. You have a space here. You are welcome here. Today is World Communion Sunday. And, and it's, so it's a day when people all over the world gather at Jesus' table and celebrate a feast. We remember that Jesus... Um, who Jesus was, and we give thanks for his life. We give thanks that no matter where we play or what we wear, whether we come from near or far, we celebrate that God is with us here. We worship God with music and art, right? We share stories from God's heart, and we remember that we are all part of God's community, God's family when we gather here. So I want you to sit up for me. And I want you to look at the people who are gathered right here. Look at each other. Now I want you to look out there and look at all of those people who are gathered there. Are any of us the same? No. No. We're all different. But we are all God's children. That's what today is all about. Every one of us is welcome here as part of God's family. Will you pray with me? We'll do it neato repeato style where I say a line and you say it back. And we'll invite everyone to join us. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that no matter where we are, you are with us. Thank you that you welcome all that you make space for everyone. We love you, God. Thank you for loving us. Amen. All right, friends, I want to invite you to walk. As we prepare our own spirits for worship, um, we're reminded um, that our children are um, a joy and a delight, reminding us of how lovely God's kingdom is. Um, I hope each day to emulate their joy, um, their authenticity, um, and their acceptance of themselves and each other. I invite you to take a deep breath and center yourself and join me as we go to God in prayer. Eternal God, in these moments of quiet, we thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you for your generous table and your wide welcome. We give thanks for the Holy One, Jesus for his grace, his love, his humility. We thank you that rather than elevating himself above us, instead he would lift us up 
and call us friends. We thank you for his many reminders that we are to love one another. But we also confess that too often we fall short of his command to love. We become upset with others and find it easier to reject them than to seek to understand and love them. We struggle with the almost impossible command to love our enemies. We become driven to meet our own needs and become blind to the needs of others. We work to succeed, sometimes becoming all-consuming, trumping our command to love. Forgive us, God, and call us once again to your table as one people, your people. Remind us that no matter where we find ourselves in this wide, wonderful world, we are connected in unity through Jesus, the one who taught us what it is to love, the one who taught us how to call one another friend. And so help us to love others when they are power hungry, and help us to love others when they are inconsiderate, and help us to love others when they are angry and lash out blindly, and help us to love others when they are selfish and insensitive. Help us, O oh God, to love others so that we may abide in your love and live as Jesus taught us, even as we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to share with you this morning what Joseph Jeter, Jr., who is a professor of homiletics at Bright Divinity, has to say about World Communion Sunday. His first scripture he references is, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Today is that day known as Worldwide Communion Sunday when Christians of every creed lay down the theological weapons which which they seek to defend their own narrow portion of the truth and come to the table with every person around the world who claims Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Worldwide Communion Sunday is a faint glimmer in the midst of almost daily, more sectarian Christianity of what Jesus meant when he said, you must all be one. We are literally gathered around the table this morning. In our DOC heritage, we are figured to gather around it every week. Why? Why this event? Why not some other event in the life of Christ? He was involved with many things that were more dramatic his inspirational nativity, his temptation in the wilderness, his baptism, his magnificent sermon on the mount, his marvelous teachings, his stunning miracles, his triumphant entry, his disgraceful crucifixion, and his glorious resurrection. All of these pack more punch than the simple lowly Passover meal he shared with his disciples, a common meal like hundreds of others they had shared. Important as the other events are, they have their season among us. We do not rehearse them week after week like we do when we remember and react the Thursday evening supper 
in the upper room. Jesus says, let, Jeter, excuse me, says, let me suggest one reason why I believe this celebration, this remembrance, has held such a focal point in the worship of the church for nearly two millennia. He says, this table has become the foundation of our faith because the things that it symbolizes for us are the primary things, the essential things, the things that have made us who we are as people. This table represents God loving us enough to send Jesus to live among us that we might behold the grace and truth of God through him. It represents Jesus loving us enough to make the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf, a sacrifice symbolized by the elements on this table. All, excuse me, and it represents the tradition of faith that we have received. People of every race and nation, in high cathedrals, bamboo shelters, people who disagree about almost everything imaginable, but still coming to a table to proclaim faith in God. This is the foundation, and it is a firm one, one not built on sand, but on the solid rock of Christ. As disciples of our Lord and Savior, Christians all over the world, and we gather around our communion table today to celebrate our new life and our oneness in Christ. This is an open table, a table where all are welcome. Our faith in him brings us together in a common bond of fellowship. And as we approach the communion table, we celebrate again the sacrifice that he made and the victory that he won for us. We must remind ourselves of the great truth that the church, which is the one body of Christ, is one. In Ephesians 4, 4 to 6, the scriptures tell us we have one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God. As we gather at this Lord's table each Sunday, it is a way to witness to the world that we have a common faith in our Lord, which is made possible by the great sacrifice that these enduring symbols represent. When we are communion with Christ at his table, we are emphasizing our oneness in him and with each other. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we come to this place around uh, your table because there's nothing, nothing more precious than our Lord and Savior Jesus. There's no fellowship more supportive than this church. There are no songs we enjoy more than those of our faith. There's nothing more meaningful than this Holy Communion. We draw near to you, O oh God, in humility, in reverence, knowing that in you we will receive your gift of forgiveness, hope, and grace, now and forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he betrayed, took the bread, and after breaking it and giving thanks, he said, this is my body, which is given for you. After supper, Jesus did the same thing with the cup. This is a cup of my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this, Remember me. As often as we do this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death till he comes.
Our text today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. I invite you to hear these holy words. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today's scripture picks up where last Sunday's scripture left off. If you were here last Sunday, you might remember uh, what that scripture was about, but if you didn't, here's just a quick recap. Um, Last week, we were in John 15, just a few uh, verses earlier, and Jesus was using the metaphor of the vine and the branches, where God is the vine grower who carefully tends to the vine, Jesus is the true vine, and Jesus' disciples are the branches. Then Jesus calls on his disciples to abide in him, to remain in his love as he has remained in God's love. And he tells them, he tells us, that when we abide in him, when we abide in the true vine, we will produce good fruit. So today, as we hear in the scripture that Robin just read, Um, Jesus continues on and he gives a a concrete picture of what this good fruit looks like. He he gives us a picture of what this good fruit is. It's love. Let's look again at John 15. We'll, We'll go the first half, 9 through 12, which says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. You can just hear how many times love is being spoken there. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be made complete in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. The good fruit that we are to bear in this world, it is love. But it is not just any kind of love. It is the kind of love that the Father has toward the Son. A love that is creative and it is life-giving. It's the kind of love that Jesus has for his disciples, for his followers. A love that chooses to love like God. A love that keeps God's command to love. It is a love that doesn't run out. 
It has no sense of an ending because Jesus' call is for His disciples to continue to carry it forward as they bear more and more good fruit. Jesus' call to His disciples, to His followers, to us, is to love like He loves. And we have some sense of what that kind of love looks like, don't we? In the Gospels, when we read all through the Gospels, Jesus breaks down the commandments. And He says that the greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. In other words, abide in God's love. And then He says, the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. This is the kind of love that Jesus has for others. He makes neighbors of all kinds of folks. Even people that others would consider enemies or consider expendable or invaluable. Jesus' love for others is a radically welcoming kind of love. Jesus' love is healing. Jesus' love brings life. And this kind of love is our calling. When we do it, we abide in Jesus. It's also important for us to have some context, I think, for what's happening here in this 15th chapter of John's Gospel when Jesus is commanding his disciples to love as he loves. This is part of what is known as uh, the farewell discourse. He has made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on what we usually know as Palm Sunday. He has come in to the holy city and he has gathered with his disciples for their last supper together. They're in that upper room and Jesus in John's gospel gets up from the table where they have been eating and he takes a basin and a, a pitcher of water and a towel and he gets down on his knees and he washes his disciples' feet. From that humble act, we can see a clear picture of the kind of love Jesus is talking about. It's a love that is in service to others. It isn't just an inward or feeling kind of love. It is an outward demonstrated love. It is an active love. And as Jesus continues to speak of this command to love, here in chapter 15, he goes even deeper. Let's pick back up at, at verse 12 where we left off, where it says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And then he says, no one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant doesn't know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. And look, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And I appointed you to go and to bear fruit, fruit that will last. Jesus is about to demonstrate the ultimate act of love for his disciples, for us, for the entire world. From these words that he shares with his disciples in the upper room on that evening of their last supper, he will go out into the garden and pray he will be put on trial. He will be crucified. He will go to the cross. He will lay down his own life for his friends. And in his words here in verse 13, no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And in his actions on the cross, we gain the clearest understanding of the kind of love Jesus calls for. Calls for in us a sacrificial Love, a love that is so deep and so strong that it is willing to let go of self preservation 
in order to bring new life to others. Friends, this kind of love is not easy. It is not even close to being easy. I fail at it on a regular basis, but that does not stop it from being our calling. It's a, it's a love that calls for strength. It calls for courage. It, it calls for abiding so deeply in Jesus that we can withstand the seduction of the world. That seduction that lures us into, at the very least, looking out for ourselves as number one. And at the most, living in and living out division and hatred and bigotry and idolatry. All of the kinds of things that put to death the goodness of God's great love in this world. But here's the thing. You've been chosen. You've been chosen to live this kind of love. You've been chosen by Jesus Himself. Jesus who calls you friend. To go out into the world and, and outwardly live this kind of love. To bear good fruit. Fruit that will last. Because He knows that you are capable of it. He knows that we are all capable of it. And He knows this because you were created in God's own love. And I've seen it. I think you have too. I've seen it in many different ways in the life of this congregation. I see it as you demonstrate care for one another. I see it in the decisions you make to live out our mission to extend love and respect to all. I see it in your dedication to living out God's radical welcome for all people. That is sacrificial love. It's the kind of love that offers new life to others in the name of Christ. And I've heard it expressed so many times by so many people in this church. Our church is a church that knows how to love. You've heard it too. Our church knows how to love deeply. I've heard people say it's just it's in our DNA. And it is because we are grafted, we are abiding in the true vine of Christ. This is who you are on the inside. And this is how you are called to live on the outside. So may we continue to abide in Christ as we seek to live inside out, demonstrating the sacrificial love of our Lord that has the power to bring new life to all, including us as we share it. Would you pray with me? You have called us as friends, O Christ. May we be strengthened by your trust in us. May our lives become an outward expression of your love in this world. As we live and move and have our being, may we so deeply abide in you that we might bear good fruit, lasting fruit that overflows with God's goodness. For this is our true calling. So we pray it in the name of the one who chooses us, our Lord Jesus. Amen. For everyone born, a place at the table. For everyone born, clean water and bread. A shelter, a space, a safe place for growing. For everyone born, a star. When we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. 
for woman and man, a place at the table, revising the roles, deciding the share, with wisdom and grace, dividing the power, for woman and man, a system that's there. And God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. For young and for old, a place at the table, a voice to be heard, a part in the song. The hands of a child, in hands that are wrinkled, for young and for old, the right to belong. God delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. For everyone born a place at the table to live without fear and simply to be, to work to speak out, to witness and worship for everyone born the right. When we are creators of justice, justice and joy. I want to invite you to be seated. On a Sunday night about seven years ago, this high schooler walked into the gym with a bit of an attitude. <laughs> and says, I'm just here for the pizza. <laughs> and then she came back the next week for the pizza, of course. <laughs> and she kept coming back. And a year and a half later, she stood in front of this congregation at that pulpit. And she said, I'm not sure what I believe yet. But what I can say is that this place feels like home. Over the years, we have shared many conversations, laughter and tears and, and hopes and heartache. I've had the privilege of watching her grow, to take risks, to step out in faith, to try new things and to ask questions and to live in the tension of unanswered questions, to bravely claim her faith for herself. I've watched her say yes to God again and again and again. And today we have the privilege of witnessing her say yes to God one more time. And so I want to invite Chris to come join us up front. In the life of faith, it is important to be open to God's calling. Some are called to live and serve as laypersons in the congregation, and some are called to ministry as a vocation. Today, we surround Chris, who has heard God's call, 
and we commission her as she begins her theological education at Lexington Theological Seminary. So, Chris, do you believe in your heart that God has called you to vocational ministry? Will you be open to the leading of the Spirit as you study and grow in knowledge and in faith? Now it's my turn. <laughs> Will you endeavor to lead the people of God in their commitment to the global mission of the church, guiding their concern for justice and peace for all people, and taking a place of responsible leadership and service in the church and the world? And now, what a privilege it is that, that we as a congregation get to share in this good news of Chris's call to ministry. And, and part of that good news for us is that uh, we'll get to see Chris on a regular basis. Though she is going to Lexington Theological Seminary, uh, which is in Lexington, Kentucky, most of their classes are online. So she'll get to remain in this community with us, and that is such a blessing for us. But as she enters into theological education, and her, class be, her first class begins on the 10th of this month, so in just a, a few days, she needs the assurance of your participation and your support and prayers so that she can enter into this new time of study and preparation with a sense of joy and encouragement. So as a sign of our blessing... I want to invite you to uh, offer prayer together. We'll join our hearts and voices in prayer that is printed on the screen. Let's pray together. God, you, you showed, showed yourself, yourself most fully in, in the one, one who took basin and towel to wash his friend's feet. In all times, you are called leaders to serve your people. We pray that you strengthen Chris in her resolve to follow Christ in ministry and service. Give her discernment to hear your call. Quicken her imagination to find ways of communicating your abiding presence to us all. Fill our hearts with love for Chris. Let our caring actions be a source of strength and assurance for her. Amen. Amen. I know that you will want to um, be able to offer your personal blessing to Chris as you leave worship this morning. So I want to invite you to uh, stand as you're able now. Um, Chris will be uh, with us in the narthex at the end of worship. Uh, but as we have done in the last several weeks, we're going to offer our um, communal benediction together our uh, prayer so the words are on the screen let us join together we breathe, breathe in god's, god's grace may, may it transform, transform our insecurities so that we breathe out god's love we breathe in god's love may it transform our fears so that we breathe out god's hope we breathe in God's hope. May it transform our doubts so that we breathe out God's faithfulness. We breathe in God's faithfulness. May it transform our hearts so that we breathe out the good news of Christ Jesus. We breathe in the good news of Christ Jesus. May it transform us so that we breathe out God's grace. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.